So hi, Dr. Da Silva. We are really glad to have you here in this new video section from the Latin American Association of Cardiac and Endovascular Surgery. Our today's talk regards the following question. What the clash of generations with cardiac surgery can teach us? Key points that young and experienced, experienced surgeons need to understand to achieve great results. I would like to start this interview asking you if you can give like a brief uh, introduction for us, how about your biography? Where did you do your cardiothoracic training and who were the main mentors in your career? Hey, Tulio Cardonas, it's a pleasure to be here uh, talking to you um, and to pass a message uh, for the new generation of surgeons. Um, I, my name is José Pedro da Silva. I was born in Pirajuí, uh, state of São Paulo, Brazil. I first I started my career my career in Botucatu School of Medicine. Then I got a residency in São Paulo, uh, in a hospital called the, the the Hospital for the Public Ofi Officials, and it was a very important hospital at that time. And I selected that I want to do plastic surgery in his surgery initially. But then I saw heart surgery. So that's, that's the name of the game. So I decided to do heart surgery. Then I, I did my training in that hospital. And then I wrote a letter to the Cleveland Clinic to do a fellowship. And I was accepted immediately. So... I prepared for about six months, and then I moved to the United States. It was very cold. That was the worst winter in 100 years. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And I was not used to it, so it was very challenging. Uh, but then I start, I went to the hospital, and I saw my name there as on call on the 2nd of January. And, I arrived, and that was 29th of December. So then I started my training and being on call for the first day, basically. And that was very challenging because I didn't know the culture, how to, to talk to the patient exactly. But then everything went well and I became more a surgeon. I spent more time in, this, in the operating room while I was kind of learning more English to be ready to, to, take, to talk to the patient directly. So after that, I went back to Brazil. Uh, I worked there for four years. It was a tough beginning, but then I became very important there. I started, uh, I became, they asked me to stay and stay, and I became an associate staff in the fourth year. And then um, my family wanted me back. I want to go back to Brazil. And, uh, but in Cleveland, uh, the last few years, I used to do for uh, operation in the same room. Basically, and they're not so big operation, but, but they was to finish my third operation before the other would finish the second. So I will call to my room the next patient. And then if the surgeon wants to, to fall, fine, but usually I would do by myself. And it was a great opportunity. Uh, it was a hard work. Uh, we arrived at 7.30, started the operation at 8 o'clock. And then we finish that. They have the room uh, where the anesthesia would start. So, and then after we're finished, in about three minutes, the other patient was in the room already. And we have a, a, about 15 minutes to do something <laughs> in between cases. So it was, it was like a, a factory, the Cleveland Clinic at that time. In the uh, late 70s, early 80s. So I left the place, went to Brazil. Then I started thinking, well, that residency was tough. I have to stay on call like during the three months, every third day. And then the next day, after being on call 40, uh, 24 hours, I would stay there until like two o'clock. So sometimes I was very tired, but I think it was too much. Today, I think we have rules that cannot happen. I think it was too much, but I took advantage of that, doing a lot of case and uh, get trained. So there's not, that's gonna be just a short time in my career. It was, it went, it was four years and I did 600 cases by myself. 
So by working hard, I would get a benefit from it. And I, I became like a golden boy for some surgeons there, which was very nice. Then I went to Brazil. In Brazil, I, I didn't go to the university. I went to some uh, to uh, the Beneficencia Portuguesa, but to work with the most one of the most famous page, uh, surgeon there, uh, Jesus Zerbini, Euclides Jesus Zerbini, Doctor Zerbini. So uh, it was him and Jatene, the the two well-known surgeons in the country. So I worked with him three years, and then I had the chance to do my own group. When I start my own group, I start, you know, uh, those cases that I need to resolve, like uh, VSD uh, after infarction. So uh, it was a very challenge at that time. Nowadays, I think it is too, but now we have ECMO. So we, we that helped. We have assistance that we didn't have that time. We had just the balloon, the intraortic balloon pump. And so... I start doing that. I developed a technique because the case didn't do well at the Cleveland Clinic. So I start put a patch in the left side. So, so that's the first mess. Try to resolve the problems, and we still have problem. When you think you don't have any more problem, you still have things that you can uh, develop and improve. So, and then I start to do sequential mammary graft, which I didn't publish. Uh, but I present in Germany in 84, um, uh, 50 case. Another guy present following me, seven case, and he published first. So then I became so mad at me that I didn't publish. Uh, uh, so that's another lesson. If you have an idea, you publish it, <laughs> make it public. Uh, so then uh, I was, then, then I, I had a patient who, uh, who need to do was um, v, he had a VSD transposition and pulmonary stenosis. So I was doing uh, the operation, uh, the regular operation, closing the VSD and put a conduit uh, from, from the RV to the pulmonary artery. But then I start calling those patients and they, and all the time uh, they said, well, I was doing well and then died. So I said, well, we have to do something about that. Then I started doing the pulmonary root translocation because I used the pulmonary valve for those cases. Uh, uh, then you can read about those papers if you want to uh, to see what uh, the operation is about. So to make, uh, and then finally, uh, at the same year, I thought about doing the cone because I was trying to do the Daniels operation for IBC anomaly. And then I have a patient too that didn't work, and then I, and we, we know that doesn't work to all patients. We have to replace the valve with the Dennis operation about fifty percent of the patient. So I said, well, uh, let's play a little bit with the valve. So I tried to mobilize the valve, and and, may, and then I said, well, this can encounter the other side, and then we have a nice uh, operation. That was the con, and then. I was about to publish and I saw Carpentier. I didn't know because it was, it was more coronary artery surgery, that surgeon at that time. So I I started doing, uh, so I said, well, uh, he said in his, if you read his uh, uh, his abstract, he say, well, my operation covered 360 degree of the tricusp orifice. It does, but it does with a, uh, 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 monocost. So then I saw someone present. It's oh, mine is completely different. Then I published very quickly, uh, and 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 this became famous. And now recently, I saw another issue that people are doing stars, but then they were gonna do do the star operation. I don't know if everybody knows, but that we exclude the right event, and then uh, and then the patient would go to Glenn. And then Fontaine. Everybody knows that Fontaine is not an excellent solution, as an excellent solution for a certain patient, but has limitations uh, with complication and the life expectancy is shorter, uh, like 40 years or less, liver problems. So then I said, well, we 
we can take the shunt to have whatever gland, we can take the patch and add some more blood in the circulation. And that worked. So now we are doing, everybody is doing that. So, and this was recently, was nine, two, not, 2019. So always there's something to learn, learn all the time and, and to come up with new ideas too. So I think that was too long, but that is the summary for my career. Yeah, it sounds really good. It's really inspiring for sure. And it's in interesting to see that you could find new solutions that motivated you to change the field that we were that you were working. Like you are in the beginning, like a cardio a, a cardiac thoracic surgery, more like in the coronary well, field. Coronary surgery. Yeah. Exactly. When, I was, when I was in the Cleveland Clinic, eighty percent of our patients was coronary artery surgery. Yeah, and, and so, if you ask what changed, what changed that you had coronary. Um, angioplasty, right? A percutaneous treatment of coronary artery disease. And we start not so well. Uh, and then we had a lot of opportunity for emergency surgery. I remember the guy, uh, guy calling me and said, well, we need to resolve this problem because they just did the uh, um, uh, dilated, the, the right coronary artery. And the lady now has an infarction and she's, uh, was Antonio Emilio in Brazil, uh, a relative. And I was there seven o'clock in the morning and, and I heard that. Then I talked to Dr. Zerbini, I said, you take care of that. I have to do a follow, the trial of follow now. Then I took care. So, and, and I did the operation. I found that she had also LAD. So I did both things and I did it very quickly. So I reperfused her in an hour, 40 minutes on that moment. Mm -hmm. So eight, eight, for eight hours and 40 minutes, an hour after I was informed, the patient had the right, was perfusing the right, uh, the right coronary artery area. So uh, Cleveland Clinic taught me how to do those things. Uh, but then came the stent and the result improved. But, but still there's room for the coronary artery surgery. But the thing is, now you have to be careful, have to, uh, to prioritize the quality of your repair, the quality of coronary artery grafting, so you can compete with the other techniques uh, as a surgeon. And the other thing is that the surgeon should start doing uh, those interventions too, because then they, they can resolve, they can do part with the intervention, part uh, with other techniques, and uh, and then it can have a, a perfect solution for many uh, patients. And also, the other thing that we didn't have before was myocardial protection. Now, as you know, we had uh, you can operate in a patient for three, four hours, especially in kids, and they survive and they do well as far as the uh, ventricular uh, function. So. That's very helpful, but then that teaches people that you have to do in a good time, keep a good flow of your operation, but try to do it perfectly. Because then yeah. if the, the heart suffer, you can support, and then you optimize your results. So uh, so that's one thing that changed, and nowadays um, I think we can take advantage of that. Yeah, that's one question that exactly in this context, uh, you commented about percutaneous coronary intervention and also like the new cardioplegias. That's mm -hmm. exactly like one question in our topic. What do you think are the main elements that we nowadays have, like the young generation have, and are extremely positive and that did not exist during your training? For example, any kind of technologies or innovations. What are the positive points that the, like the positive things that the young generation have nowadays? Well, first, I have to tell you about one thing that is common. You have to be patient-centered. So if you're a surgeon, you took care of a patient, you did an operation, then you have to pay attention to the patient and take care of him, uh, where, uh, you know, giving 100% of your attention to him. So he doesn't die. Uh, he will be happy with his family, and, and you will be happy with your career, and you'll be successful. So, and this 
didn't, didn't change. Then what changed is that ECMO, for example, especially for children, is an, we didn't have that. So if you took too long to do an operation or if the, you did something wrong, the patient would die and die on the table. Now patients don't die on the table anymore. So you can put an ECMO, you can take to the cat lab, find out what is wrong, if there's anything to correct. If there's nothing to correct, you give time to the heart to recover. So with this, the operation, uh, if you do a good indication, can be near zero. So what we're gonna have lose patient by stroke and or by infection. But other, other than that, you rarely um, lose a patient nowadays. So this is a big advance. Of course, myocardial protection, the other one, when I was a resident, if the guy gave a, a valve, a aortic valve to replace, the, you could cool a little bit, but there was no cardioplasia. So we have to do it uh, within 35, 40 minutes to get a uh, good result. And, and to, like the transplant, the first one I, I did, well, that time we, we had cardioplasia already. So, but still you get used to it. So you do a little quicker than, than the usual because of that conception. But but today, I think surgeon cannot waste time. But uh, but if you have to take more time to do something more complex, then you have cardioplegia, then you have a cyst, uh, you have ECMO, and then you have if you need long term support, then you have a cyst divide that you can uh, support the patient for a long time, and then you can choose about keeping the patient assist device or transplant the patient. So to, to finish up, so you have a lot of things to do to a patient to prevent him from dying. And then you have you can optimize your results. And the other thing, you can be less invasive surgically by doing a robotic surgery. The, the robotic operation nowadays take a long time, uh, but after you improve the machine, if you compare today and like 15 years ago, then you have different equipment uh, and you'll be, surgeon, you'll be less dependent on the surgeon uh, skill. You'll be, I think always the surgeon will intervene with the machine, but that tend to be uh, improved over time. So be maybe could transform in, in the main type of operation for uh, for most uh, case uh, to, in the future. Okay, that sounds really good. I think it was like a really good overview because you work like with different generations of cardiac surgeons. We are really glad to have you here. So thank you very much, Dr. Da Silva. And mm -hmm. I wish you like a good day. Thanks so much. It was a great opportunity. Bye-bye.